Okay, a lot of you guys are coming up with questions which we're going to be dealing with later. And unfortunately, with what I'm speaking about, there's no beginning, there's no end. So I can only describe it like this. Well, it's a circle, and we start on the one side and we, we talk. But what happens is we talk and it overlaps like this, and then we talk on something else and it overlaps, and then we talk here and it overlaps. So eventually, we hope that that whole circle is pretty colored in and you've got a rough idea. <laughs> now, even if I had 10 days, I'd still be talking. <laughs> so, bear with me, and we try and give you as much as possible to start and to get an understanding. I am available on the internet if you care to email me. I will reply to you sometime. I can't promise immediately because people are emailing me from all over the world all the time. And I can't answer people's questions. Just don't ask me to make decisions for you. Because I can't. I can't. It's the one can't. I can't. <laughs> You must take responsibility for your own decisions, and that's all part of your own attitude. And we, as people on the land, must be like our forefathers and show people that we don't need to be told what we can do and what we can't do. Okay? So be responsible and take responsibility for your own decisions. And all will be well. Any other questions? I've got one, and if you want to defer it to later. Stocking density, you talked about you have to get to this point. How do you figure out that point, and how do you monitor that point? Because I assume it does change depending on our environment. Yeah, stock density for every area, every part of the brittleness scale has a different stock density, and it is dependent on rainfall, on soils, on all sorts of factors. So I will not give you an optimum stock density. You need to play with it on your own property. And I'll explain to you how to use inclusion zones instead of exclusion zones. It is no good trying to monitor history. You need to know where you're going forward. So that's why I call it an inclusion zone. And in fact, I can talk about it right now. <laughs> You know, as I said, there's no beginning and there's no end, so I can talk any time, and if it's pertinent, but if we cross over and talk about it again, it doesn't matter, because it'll just reinforce it in your mind. What are we talking about? Inclusion. Increasing stock density. There was something else I was going to say. How do you figure out the density for your property? Oh, thank you. Sorry. This is what happens to me. And then my mind's over there somewhere and I'm talking back there. Okay. So we have a ranch and we have various, notice my fences, none of them are straight. Because in nature there are no straight lines. People get fixated with straight fences. I've got a rancher in Texas who got me there. He's been following me for five years, and I still go to his ranch for four days every year, and it's big. His one paddock is 12,000 acres. And we were putting up an electric fence, and I was going in his uh, RTV and just throwing out the droppers, or the treadens as you call them in this country, and I had a reel at the back and I was letting out the tape as we went. And his children were putting it in for me. And there he was behind the children straightening the fence. <laughs> and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm straightening the fence. I said, just go home. <laughs> and it's because of this rock that he's got about a straight fence that he couldn't implement what I've been trying to tell him for four years. And that, that's how strong that paradigm is, people. So that's why I talk about attitude and how important it is to understand that there is another way of doing it. 
There's more than one way of skinning a cat, so just skin it, get it done. Okay. So, you've got all these paddocks and the cattle are moving from, let's say we have 200 acres. Okay, and we've got 100 head of cattle. And they happen to be in this paddock and they're going to go move into this paddock. Okay, paddock number one, paddock number two. So when they move through from the one paddock to the other, at the gate I make an inclusion zone. It's got no water, it's a bit of electric fencing, preferably taped so they can see it. And as they go through the gate, in fact it can be included on the gate. If you want to, to make it easy, the gate is in the middle. Put it in there. Put them in there and then sit down and leave them in there until whatever, until they can't graze anymore or everything's trodden on the ground. You know the area of that. You know how many cattle you've got. So you work out your stock density. Be careful of stocking rate and stock density. They are two totally different things. Stocking rate is the number of cattle. We've got a stocking rate here of one to two. But stock density, we can get to 2,000 head per hectare if we want to. And you can. But you play with it in your environment to achieve what you want to achieve. So once you've done this, you've done this and it's small, and let's say this is now, for simplicity, an acre. And then you're going to do it on this one here, and it's going to be two acres. And then over here, it's going to be three acres. Whatever. Have fun. Okay? And you will see the next time you come around to graze, what has happened. It will be totally different from what you used to. Right. So you play around with stock density and you get to where you want to be in your area. Your neighbor will be something totally different because he's wanting something different from his animals. Remember selection is condition. So you've got to leave enough selection, but at the same time you want to trample carbon, you want to invest for the future, and you're putting down carbon. And that carbon is not just brown. It's green, it's brown, it's whatever color you want. But we'll come back to that as to where to start, and it comes in a little bit later. Okay. Now, I keep on saying, and you'll hear it many, many times, it's the energy that we are there to harvest. So this particular paddock has already been raised. Remember when I go into winter, often prior to me doing holistic management, some of my grass got to nearly as high as that beam. Yeah. You park a vehicle in it, you can't see it. So that's how high the grass can get, whatever. So we need to change things to capture more energy and enable the animal to eat it. Now obviously you can't eat that grass because it's fibrous and it's got no, no nutrition in it. But it's fire reliant, okay, and it needs long recovery periods. And that's what happens. But I can change that and I know I can change it. And that's why on your map, your future resource base, you plan what you want your ranch to look like in two generations time. Do you want it open woodland? Do you want a total grassland? Because you can get it there just with animals. And you plan now for them. Okay. So we need to capture that energy to keep ourselves alive. And it's the free energy from the sun. It's the solar energy and in actual fact you are in the energy business and the land is your solar panel and you need to tweak your solar panel to be more efficient than it was. Now man-made solar panels when they first came out were only capturing 32% of the energy available at soil surface level. Why? Because we humans look at it in a linear format 
And that's what we're best at. We're best at sending rockets to the moon, mechanics, computers. Oh, we're good at all that stuff. But the minute we start looking at multidimensional aspects, we can't cope with it because the complexity, we can't use it, we can't work it through our brain. Okay? So that is why a solar panel that is man-made captures 32% of the energy available. And yet you take a leaf, and it doesn't matter if it's off a tree or a piece of grass, it captures over 90% of the energy available. Why? It's multidimensional, it's a living organism, and it can capture energy. So that's what we need to promote, and we need to understand how to promote it and get it there. So again, energy is money, money is energy, time is money. So equate that to all your actions. Now, if you are running 100 head of stock, okay, and you have uh, two laborers per 100 head, and you pay your laborers as you would like to pay them, there is another way. You should only have one laborer per 2,000 head. Now, I'm only saying 2,000 head because that's where I've got probably five to 8,000 head is more like it. And it's a paradigm shift because the animal behavior changes with the more animals in the herd. So instead of being flighty, the more animals that are there, they calm up. You're moving them more often because you are trying to emulate the big herds of animals that were here prior to man shooting them all out. And really, you're just guiding them to be at a certain place at a certain time. Land grazing. So that's what we do. And at the same time, we're feeding the soil, we're feeding the animal, we're selling some of the animals, and we're making a living. And just every time you need something, think about it, and next day you won't need it. And next time you want to do capital infrastructure, delay it for three months and you'll find another way you won't need it. When I got to over a thousand head in a herd, I thought, oh, I need new sorting facilities. No, because you can sort in the paddock when they get to 2,000 head because they stand there and look at you. <laughs> and if you've done some low-stress livestock handling, you just take out what you want to take at the gate. So why do you need handling facilities? The only handling facility I use is to dehorn calves. Calves. <laughs> but we will get over that because we are now putting in bulls that are natural poles. A bull rod comes from Kenya. The Messiah will lead us in that. You guys use Borok? Short, compact animal. And yet you go to a conventional farmer and you'll say, No, I don't like Boron. Because it slaughters out at a lower percentage than other cattle. Joe, you know all about that. But yes, to get it to that percentage, you've got to give it more. And I'm all about making money, energy, putting it in my pocket and keeping it there. So it doesn't matter if it only slaughters out 50% instead of 62, because it's cost me so much less. It's all about producing your animal or your kg pound of beef for less, not more. Because why for less? Because your inputs are less, and you've always got a market. If you're selling less than your neighbor, do you think you haven't got queues of people buying your beef? The last thing we do is put money into marketing. Weak link, financial weak link. Energy conversion from the sun, product conversion, marketing. You start off in a product conversion weak link, all of us, because we, in actual fact, have got more food than animals. We then go to an energy conversion weak link where we need fencing or watching. And we go back and forwards to energy conversion, product conversion, energy conversion, product conversion. And the last thing we spend money on might be marketing. <coughs> now this is totally contrary to conventional thinking. But if your pound of beef, chicken, pig, pork, whatever, is half the price of anybody else's, have you not got a market? You don't have to market anything. The guys will be queuing at you. It's about volume. So, yes. So, when you start saying, no, I've got to create the market before I have the produce, it's 
the force before the donkey, before the cart, or the horse before the cart. You've got to get it the right way around. Okay. You have a ready market. A colleague of mine farms in Botswana. He spent much of his life driving to Gaborone, which is two days driving away, sitting on a board to get, money, to get the beef into Europe. Okay? Because they've got a higher price in Europe. I said to him, you're crazy. But he said, look at all the money we make by getting it into Europe. I said, don't worry, it'll be cheaper if you just sell it on the farm. And now he thought you were going to get one and two people coming and buying on the farm. And he, his cattle have gone from 800 to 4,000 on the same farm because of holistic management. Okay, in the Kalahari Desert, that's where he farms. And he didn't gather the concept that you still sell in bulk. But if your bulk is per kg cheaper, you're going to have every Muslim in Botswana with his truck there, waiting to load, just waiting for you to open the lock on the gate. That's what he should have done, because the minute they got it into Europe, the financial collapse happened. Europe closed their markets. All the time he had spent running to, and two vehicles he destroyed running to the capital, to certain meetings, was wasted. Remain in your sphere of control and not in your sphere of concern. You can't control it. Stay out of it. You'll get hurt. Stephen go ahead and run. Sorry, ma'am, you had a question. Well, I think it, it circles back to when you were saying about the, the number of people that you have to manage the number of animals. And I guess what I'm trying to think is there's another slogan we hear, the eyes and acres idea. So I understand that you can manage a larger herd and that there's an efficiency and it makes a lot of sense and animals do behave differently. But how are you able to keep an eye on all the land with just one person? I mean, that is, are you giving up some of your monitoring when you're saying, well, I, I'm having a labor efficiency, but maybe, I mean, who's monitoring? I'd say we don't have to think about that. I've got to be very careful what words I choose because <laughs> If you did everything holistic management asks you to do, you will spend your life monitoring and running around in circles for the glorification of holistic management. <laughs> Let's glorify you as an individual, as a landowner and as a farmer, and monitor what is necessary. Now what is necessary? The animal. That's why I had that slide on. Watch the animal. If you're looking at an animal, the left hand side is full, Dunk pads are perfect, the animal is relaxed, the urine pH is 7, everything's happy, everybody's happy, you'll be happy. Why monitor anything else? Because the car is telling you everything. So monitor the animal and you will know everything you need to know. But learn to monitor the animal, and most of us can't monitor the animal, and then we're told to scratch on the ground. Now with my hips, I can't get on the ground. <laughs> so I'm not going to go down there and start scratching. <laughs> so, sorry, does that answer your question? But again, if we if we take the Amish for existence, for example, if all the Amish put all the herd in a county into one cow, mm. and they put three guys to milk all those cows in that county, the problem is the others wouldn't know what to do with themselves. But in actual fact, the grass would do better, the cattle would do better, they'd have more milk, the equations would be energy efficient, and all would be well, but it's a concept. And they all just shake their heads and say, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want son, so he doesn't manage the cattle properly. Why? Because you give it bells every day? Don't give it any bells. We haven't got too many people on the world, in the world, we've got too many people in the wrong place. So if all of them came out of the cities, and each came and lived in our properties, and each one milked their own cow in the morning, attended their own vegetable garden, and went and worked where they had to work, things would be different. But it's to our advantage of what's happened, and we put them all in that corral, and keep them there. <laughs> So we need to save the people on the land. Don't try and save the world, because you can't save the world until you save the people on the land. 
And those are the ranches the farmers grew. And we need to feed the world. Now, if we keep on reducing the cost of our inputs, in other words, the cost of production, we will feed the world. And there will be a surplus of food. And it will be affordable and will be a safer world. Because hungry people change government. <laughs> now I'm serious. We know in Africa. And we in Africa and South Africa are heading that way fast. Because all people who felt uncomfortable, let me rephrase that. Mugabe just went in and took the land. Okay? And there was a worldwide outcry, you can't do this, it's terrible, and people suffered. Including Peter, including my brother-in-law, Peter Quinton. All lost their land for nothing. Just taken away. Our government was more clever than that. They knew that if you made people unhappy, they would go. So they made the laws, let me rephrase it. If you have a paradigm, and a paradigm is a way you do things, you get comfortable in that paradigm because you know it's the way you do things. So the minute the law is changed, you revert to zero. Okay? And when you revert to zero, you've got to build and learn a new way of doing things. So if the law keeps changing every year, you sit at zero. Now I don't care what the color of your skin is, black, white, green, blue. If you're at zero long enough, you're going to say, I'm out of here. And this is exactly what's happened in South Africa. People have sent their children into countries like America to go and go to universities. They've married locally. The parents in Africa have sent the money to America to buy the ranch. The son and the daughter-in-law are established. And the parents are now setting up the big farmers, the big men, the men who feed the country, the 20% that feed 80% of, produce 80% of the food. Boy, the writings on the wall last year was the first year we had to have a net import of agricultural product in South Africa. And that knowledge has not just gone to America, it's gone to Nigeria, it's gone to Kenya, it's gone to Uganda, it's gone everywhere in Africa. But our government is still sitting with a policy where it is better to be rid of that wild white male South African farmer. That's my problem and not yours. Right. We have spoken about energy, and this now is some of Dick Divin's work. Any of you heard of Dick Divin? Brilliant, American, and really down to earth. He knew what he was talking about. Sadly, Dick died a couple of years ago, and he put in a wet graph the energy required for a lactating cow. Now, obviously, these months of the year on the outside, are written for America, so you guys should understand them quite easily because it's for your northern hemisphere. And this is the amount of energy required by a lactating cow through the year if and when you cough. That is the amount of energy, I beg your pardon. That is the amount of energy, the red one, available at soil surface level throughout the year. I apologize. That is the amount of energy available at soil surface level. That is the amount of energy required by a lactating cow. So when I talk about a lactating cow, That is where she calves, calves, okay? And that's a requirement through her lifespan to be able to produce and be in calf again and calf again for the next year. Now we know that 80% of the fetus growth takes place in the last two months of pregnancy. From there to there. We know that the reconception of a car is directly related to the condition of the car at calving, at calving. She's had this time to recoup from a winter, doesn't matter how bad or dry the winter was. But we still want to carve in the middle of winter. 
don't know, you Americans like going out in this white stuff that is so cold. I mean, it's horrific stuff. So, for goodness sake, just carve when nature wanted you to carve. The animals will tell you. Okay? And that's what happens. So you superimpose those and put them together. That's what you get. Now, it does not matter if you don't like that. You can carve camp any time of the year that you want to. But understand, it's going to cost you a bit more. Because you've got to get the animal in the right condition, you've got to feed the fetus for that last 80% growth, and you've got to have a baler and a tractor to do whatever you need to do to be able to feed them when the white is on the ground outside. And that's what happens. So your cost of production goes up. But it's all a scam. It's a lie, people, that we are taught that we've got to carve in the winter in America so that the people in town can take all the money. It's a scam. But we believe it. And it's your fault. Look in the mirror and there's the problem. But if you want to do it, that's great. in my latitude and he will give you exactly your carving date. Now I had worked out through plotting wild animals at home as to when I should carve. So I plotted against Carly. And I ended up with something pretty much like that. Alright? The smaller the animal, the earlier in the spring it calves because of selective grazers. So I put my animal, the weight of my animal, um, I beg your pardon, this is weight and not carving time, it's weight. So the, young, the smaller the animal, the sooner in the spring it calf, and the heavier it was the later. So I put my beef cattle in, and I found I should be calving on the 15th of December. Remember we're in the southern hemisphere, and that would equate to the 15th of July for you guys, middle of summer. And then I gave my coordinates to Dick Dillon, who said, no, you should actually carve on the 24th of December. Now, 24th is a a social tricky time of the year. You know, in Africa it closes down for two months over Christmas. And it's a difficult time. All the family wants to be there and you want to be away or whatever. So it, it, created, it could create a social issue. But really, it's not a problem because you shouldn't be monitoring your cattle every day while they're carving anyway. So go away on the 23rd, come back a month later and everything's happened. What a pleasure. <laughs> But yeah, that's how close it was with wild animals and what Dick did. But needless to say, at the moment we've gone back to leaving the bulls in, because what do you do with the bull when you take him out? And we humans have messed cattle up so much that the ability to conceive at a certain time of the year has been destroyed, and it's because of the supplements that we've given them throughout the year. So when a farmer comes to me and says, oh, be careful, that bull is going to make its calf, well, of course it is, because you've fed the calf something at a time of the year it shouldn't have been fed anyway. But if you let it go back to nature's time, very few of those calves were conceived from its father. Because the teeth are shooting or something is changing and it's not mature enough to be made at that time. Okay. So that background is having to be in January, that's right? Um, June. 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 I think it's June. Yeah, June. June. In January. Okay. 
and that's June. South African time? No, our time. Our time. So our time. Yeah. This is Northern Hemisphere, yeah. Right. 